Tonight, however, we are going to deal with really one of the toughest subjects, and I actually did an entire special class for this, I want to say a summer and a half ago, a year and a half ago during the summer, I did a, a I think a six part that turned maybe into an eight part series on anti-Semitism. And we only made it as far as the early 20th century and to, to try to even attempt to climb the mountain that is uh, the Holocaust and so forth, though we, we certainly set it up so that it made it, made it more uh, uh, comprehensible uh, to figure out how the conditions were set for it in Europe, but we didn't even get to it. We're not going to tonight either, because we're going to go way, way back and hopefully make our way through what, as it turns out, is much more history than some people expect when we do this kind of thing. So first of all, let's just talk about the word as we enter the subject, anti-Semitism. Um, I want to just address the spelling of it. Uh, how do you spell anti-Semitism and what the heck does it even mean? I, for one, spell it as one word. And the reason that I do that with no dashes, no capital A, no capital S, is because of the misunderstandings that have grown and, uh, and in a sense, some anti-Semitic commentary, if you will, on the, on the nature of the word. Uh, there are no Semites that, that uh, anti-Semitism is aimed at. Let's be very clear. Semit, Semite or Semitic refers to a language group. It's not an ethnicity. It's not a nationality. It is only a language group. Linguists use it. It gives the false impression that anti-Semitism is something that is aimed against all those people. And while absolutely hatred of Muslims or Assyrians or anyone else who speaks a uh, Semitic language or who originates in the area where Semitic languages were spoken is a horrible thing. This word was invented as a pseudoscientific way to describe Jewish race hatred. And we know Jews aren't a, ra a race, but th that's where it came from. Now, there's a long history of it, which I covered in that eight-part eight class, uh, but it, we generally trace it to 1879 to one particular German journalist, a fellow named Wilhelm Marr, who coined the uh, who coined the word uh, in German, of course, antisemitismus, um, which by which he meant uh, opposition to the Jews as a people, opposition to the Jewish spirit. He wrote this, um, and uh, a related word, not his, philosemitism, which can have sort of an ugly underside as well too, because it does still. Uh, stereotype the Jews uh, was invented in 1881. So uh, that's how I spell it, and that's how I recommend spelling it. It was taught to me by a professor I took in a very a couple of very intensive seminars back in rabbinical school, and I've noticed now that it's caught on. Uh, the Forward and other Jewish journals spell it as one word, no capitals, etc. Again, only important because it has been used as a way to minimize what it means to talk about Jew hatred. So let's go all the way back, as far back as we possibly can, and first do a, a, a bit of a survey of anti-Semitism in antiquity. We're probably much more familiar with the Christian era, and we're going to cover that quite a bit, but there was anti-Semitism in antiquity. Uh, what are our sources? Well, one of the first places we see it is in the book of Esther. Right? We're going to be celebrating Purim in roughly four weeks, but that's not reliable. All that tells us is that there was, at least on some level, uh, a fear among Jews living as a minority, in this case in Persia. We believe that's, by the way, a, a book that was written in the diaspora outside of Israel. Um, Hanukkah, not exactly anti-Semitic, even though the popular retellings of it are. Uh, but when we get to the age of the Roman Empire, we start to see pre-Christian anti-Semitism. Uh, one of the very first recorded pogroms, uh, that's an uprising against the Jews, for those of you unfamiliar with the term, uh, occurred in Alexandria, Egypt in 38. It was reported there that Philo, by Philo, who was a, a Jewish scholar uh, outside of the rabbinic realm, so he was a Hellenistic Jewish scholar who was preserved actually uh, by the monasteries later on, that when Caligula 
issued a decree that he be worshiped as a god and they refused, violence broke against the Jews. And it apparently was not insignificant, but it may have been related also to events that were happening inside Israel. So it might've had political overtones as well. Once again, in 66 CE, we had more outbreaks of violence in Alexandria. And why Alexandria? It was one of the largest uh, diaspora communities in the world at that time. It was extremely significant. Uh, and these were certainly connected to what was going on in the land of Israel with the uprisings that came to be known, uh, named by uh, Josephus, the historian Josephus, as the Jewish War. Uh, there were reports, and I don't know how reliable they are, but there were reports of as many as 50,000 Jewish deaths. But it's actually in, in, in this area that we find, in this area of the world, Alexandria, Northern Egypt, that we find the first um, documented explanations about why people hate the Jews. Uh, now, in, in some cases, we actually don't have their writings. We have the writings against them, the retorts of the Jews. But one, one place that we do is from the beginning, and this goes back further, the beginning of the third century BCE, uh, again, a Hellenized community, but not the Roman Empire, uh, a, a, an Egyptian priest named Manetho, I'm sure I'm saying it wrong, M-A-N-E-T-H-O. -E um, he's also responsible for some cockamamie theories about uh, who, who the Hebrews were that lived in Egypt. Um, and it's in the same story. But in this particular narrative that it, it contains really raw hatred for the Jews, he, he, tell, he retells the story, the biblical tale, of the exodus of the Israelites. But he does it in such a way that he associates them with this, anti, with this uh, Western Semitic group called the Hyksos, who had for some period of time, and that's legitimate, um, and, and, and it's been proven, uh, ruled in Egypt. But he turns the Exodus story upside down. So what does he say? He turns it from an act of liberation of Jewish people into one in which the Jews were expelled from Egypt at the command of the Egyptian gods because they were so unclean. He talks about how the Jews, when they apparently took control, some people for a long time really did believe that these Hyksos were Joseph. And the, and the Israelites who moved over there, but the years don't match up, nothing matches up, uh, that, that they had begun a regime of oppression in Egypt and that it was the Egyptians who were victims of brutal violence at their hands and that it was the, the Pharaoh who was the big hero. So this is the earliest anti-Semitic writing that we have and it's uh, over 2,300 years old. We don't see anything in writing again and we don't have the work that I'm about to talk about in writing until a fellow named Appion. Appion is a first century Alexandrian character who apparently wrote in support of this text that he still had in his position, in his possession. Uh, and we know about him again because of Josephus. Now, this guy was apparently important enough that Josephus wrote an entire book called Against Appion. And that's how we know what Appion was claiming. And it was as follows. The Jews were descended, he said, from a leprous group of Egyptian slaves. They were well known for their characteristics as misanthropes who performed human sacrifice while worshiping the head of an ass. <laughs> they were aware of the Jewish dietary laws. This was something that for many uh, was, was a, a big bone of contention because of its implied separatism from other people. Um, and and uh, they, they believed that the animals that we, the Jews back then, the Israelites, the Jews, Judeans, uh, refrained from eating were the animals that were sacred to them. The, the, the pig for one. And we're going to see this repeated later on when I show you a few pictures from art in Christian Europe. They believed that circumcision was a way that the Jews had of demonstrating their uh, their their uh, uh, separate their separatist tendencies, that this was uh, to keep them apart. 
and on and on and on and on. And Josephus has this wonderful, uh, and, I, and I encourage anybody who's interested in this history, this wonderful book that we have uh, that he wrote that, um, that, that answers all of the claims, which is how we know what the claims were. Where else do we have it in antiquity? Well, none other than Tacitus, one of the great historians, one of the first historians, and a senator, one of the great Roman leaders. Uh, he talks about how Jews brought disease to Egypt. He claims that everything that the Jews hold sacred uh, is profane to them and vice versa. Everything that the Jews consider profane is sacred to them. Now, by the way, the Jews in some cases, if you look at some of the Midrash, some of the lore of the Jews, we like some of these interpretations. Uh, one of the things that um, one of the things that they that will be that will be claimed is that the uh, the Jews worship by the rabbis that that the Egyptians worship the lamb, so the Jews sacrifice it and so forth. Um, he's accused of, and just a litany of things, he accuses the Jews of separatism, again, loyalty only to each other. This is a common thread that runs through anti-Semitism of a certain kind of lasciviousness, um, of, a, of, uh, of being beggars, dual loyalty to the countries where they live and the ones where they uh, are loyal to, aggressive proselytism, which by the way, was something the rabbis were into. They did proselytize, but the circumcision, as you know, didn't help them. So that's about the best we have for what happened in pre-Christian Rome and Europe and, and the Near East. I won't dwell too much more on it, but it shows you that for whatever reason, and it's to, to pick apart the mind of the anti-Semite, this, this ancient disease that has not never gone away and that is with us to this day is really a lost cause. There's no, it, to, to try it is, uh, you, you'll never succeed uh, because you cannot blame the group that you're stereotyping uh, uh, for, for being deserving of your hatred, in any case, anywhere. Where we begin to see um, more robust analyses by historians is pretty obvious because as anti-Semitic as some of these were, they were also based upon cultures that we don't fully understand anymore. But we all know something about the culture that ultimately took over Europe, Christianity. And we understand that Christianity has its origins in the Jewish culture. And while there's a whole different course to be taught about how Christianity, the relationship between Christianity and Judaism, where it really is an outgrowth of, of Judaism, where it's not, and it's much more of a, of a mystery religion or a, uh, or a polytheistic re religion that's adapted, that's a whole different thing, but we know they're related. And we know that because they're related, Christianity, which grew and, and saw from the very beginning Jews as a threat, because of their refusal to join, that as it happened, their, their texts, their, their scriptures, from that point on, reflect attitudes towards the Jews that contributed to a great deal of suffering on the part of the Jews. Beginning with, but not limited to at all, as you'll see, the New Testament. Now, just a couple of words about the New Testament. This is the shortest course in New Testament history you'll ever receive. Um, remember that there were no eyewitnesses to Jesus, that the New Testament does not describe Jesus in situ. It's not his life story. It's an interpretive life story. The earliest accounts of Jesus are decades and decades after his death and are tendentious to begin with. And while we believe that maybe three out of four of them were written by Jews, they were not uh, they were no longer Jews practicing Judaism, uh, nor were they the people, by the way, for whom the books are named after. Um, that's, that, that's just a, a normal thing about how ancient books were named. Uh, but the New Testament, therefore, in its telling of Jesus's life, creates a version of Jesus's life and of Jesus himself that has to deal with the fact that the Jews have not jumped on the Jesus train. In fact, to the extent that there were ever any Jews who were Christians, 
they are gone by the first generation. And there is no, no evidence that they were Christians in the theological sense that, for instance, Paul, who is, as, you know, to, as far as we can say, the first Christian and still never met Jesus, never lived there, despite uh, what, what Luke Acts says in the New Testament, and had really nothing to do with normative Judaism, um, or let's say normative Pharisaic Judaism, he's got a bone to pick. They all have bones to pick with the Jews once they begin writing these stories. I used to study all of this. I had a certain obsession with the Jewish, uh, what, what we used to call the intertestamental period and the development of Christianity uh, with one of the great scholars of Christianity who happened to be a rabbi, uh, Michael Cook from my seminary, my seminary, and I believe he's still teaching there. Um, he, took, uh, he took the New Testament and created sort of a list of 10 sources of anti-Judaism slash anti-Semitism in the New Testament. Now, keep in mind that there is something called anti-Judaism that at a scholastic level, at an academic level, is to be distinguished from anti-Semitism because it's more about the beliefs of the Jews. But in practice, they are completely the same, which is to say that the fellows that were writing this, and they were all fellows <laughs> who were writing this, uh, especially the, um, the Gospels, but also Paul, they are anti they are anti anti-Judaism, but they themselves, and at least in three cases, we believe, are Jews. So, you know, do we say they're anti-Semitic? No, they don't really fall, fall into the Appian Manatho Tacitus sort of pattern. What they do instead is they call Jewish faith and Jewish ignorance uh, in, uh, to task. So what is it that it, what we find in this realm of anti-Judaism that ultimately encourages anti-Semitism in the New Testament? Well, he broke it down this way, and I'm going to give you some specific examples after this, but not of all of these things, just of a few. Uh, one, the Jews, and this is a thread that goes throughout uh, the Gospels, the Jews are culpable for crucifying Jesus and are guilty of deicide. To get into the theological nonsense of that is beyond... Uh, beyond anything I could ever teach you. Um, two, the tribulations that the Jews suffer throughout history are God's punishment for this. Three, Jesus originally came only to preach to the Jews. This is a through line in the Gospels and also uh, Paul. But when they rejected him, he abandoned them and moved on to the Gentiles. This is really more the story of Paul than it is the story of Jesus. But of course, they're projecting their own experiences. For the children of Israel were indeed God's chosen people. And he made a covenant with them, an old covenant that has now been made forfeit by virtue of a new covenant, testament, which they've rejected. And they therefore have lost their place as God's chosen people and, it, and have been replaced by Gentiles who follow the correct faith prescriptions when it comes to Jesus as the Christ. Number five, if you don't believe that the Jews are a problem when it comes to faith, just read the Old Testament. It's filled with stubbornness and opaqueness and disloyalty to God. And that's recorded as part of the Jewish show or the characteristic of Jews and their Judaism in the New Testament. Number six, the Jewish Bible, they say, or the, the New Testament implies and what does more than imply, contains many predictions of the coming of Jesus as the Messiah. So it's filled with foreshadowing. And you, you, really, uh, you really can't believe the kinds of things that they say are foreshadowing. But I'll give you one example because it speaks to how the, the interpretive system of the Old Testament, as they call it, works for them. Uh, there's a scene where Moses is, uh, is watching his people be attacked by the enemy Amalek. And the Bible says that whenever uh, uh, the, the, the two people, um, Aaron and the other one whose name I always forget, so I'm not gonna say it, uh, Hor, uh, uh, hold up his arms, he, the, the Jewish people, the, the Israelites prevail over the Amalekites. So what do the Jews see? What do the Christians see in this? 
they see a foreshadowing of the lifting up of the arms of Jesus. They see this everywhere. They see it in the prophetic utterances of Isaiah. They see it in other narratives. Um, it's an important part of some orthodoxy to this day. I've never met um, a, um, a modern Christian who said this was anything but interpretive. Uh, and keep in mind, we do it too with this kind of story. Uh, so this isn't saying that they're interpreting it in a way that's illegitimate, but these kinds of apologetics are said by, are said by them to uh, our, bl our blindness to them is said by them to be a, uh, a reason that they can stand in opposition to Judaism. Um, okay, uh, number, I think that was number six. Yes, number seven, by the time of Jesus's ministry, uh, it is claimed Judaism was not a living faith any longer, according to uh, Dr. Cook, Rabbi Cook. Uh, number eight, Judaism's essence is primarily legalism. Now, uh, Mary, I'm, I'm, I'm a little intimidated because you have this background that I don't have, uh, but it's my understanding that was also the argument uh, in the Reformation to a certain extent. So, um, and also, by the way, the argument of the Reformed Jews, but that's another story. Um, there is, and this I hear today, to this day, uh, there is in number nine, the claim that Christianity emphasizes love while Judaism stands for uh, the wrath of God, the less merciful God. We, we hear this from time to time. Um, simply untrue. There's a lot of that loving in the Torah. Um, it's not necessarily something we should be so proud of to command someone to love is not necessarily a, a, an improvement, but that's a claim. And number 10, finally, Judaism's oppressiveness, they claim, reflects the disposition of the Pharisees, as they consistently call the rabbis, not incorrectly, uh, who in their teaching and behavior are depicted as hypocrites. So I cannot get, possibly give you uh, a, an encyclopedia of the, of the different parts of the New Testament that this appears in, or these kinds of attitudes. But I decided to, to, in, to uh, look at a, a, just a few examples. One of them is the so-called woes of the Pharisees. Mary, is this something you're familiar with, the woes of the Pharisees? Have you heard it discussed that way? Well, this is a scholar, anyway, scholars of uh, anti-Semitism or of anti-Jewishness uh, have identified um, these woes, which are prevalent in, uh, I believe, two different gospels. You'll know in a minute when I scroll down. Uh, certainly Luke, that's one of, the, one, one of the primary ones. And when I, again, when I taught this class uh, in, in eight sessions, we were able to really dig deeply. What I decided to do was just highlight a few things. So these these passages are reflecting upon um, things that are declared in this text as woes on the Pharisees. And they're coming from Luke chapter 11, uh, verses 37 through 54. So here's, chapter, here's verse 39, just to give you a flavor of it. The Lord said to him, now then, you, the Lord meaning uh, Jesus said, you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness, you foolish people. Did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? All right, so that's one teaching. It's not a terrible teaching, but notice how it is directed against the rabbis. Uh, a few verses down, there's, there are others here too. I just selected the, a few. Um, verse 30, uh, 43, woe to you Pharisees because you love the most important seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces. In other words, you don't value what's important. None of this, if said by Jesus himself, would have been a big issue. We don't know if Jesus said this or not, but that would have been sort of an inter-Jewish, intra-Jewish discussion. But when this becomes part of church history, which is what Luke and Acts are about, this is something else entirely when read by Christian eyes. Um, a few verses down, Jesus said, and you experts in the law, woe to you, because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry, and you yourselves will not lift up one finger to help them. Again, read from one direction, not the worst thing in the world, read from the other direction, when you are the one whose leaders are the Pharisees, the rabbis, you can see how this could prompt feelings about the Jews. Uh, uh, verse 52, 
Woe to you experts in the law because you have taken away the key to knowledge. Your books mean nothing. You yourselves have not entered and you've hindered those who are entering. So that's one example. Another type of criticism of the Pharisees, of the, of the rabbis, comes in uh, the book of Matthew. So this is from chapter 23. Uh, here we have verse 5. Everything they, the Pharisees, the rabbis do, is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels in their garments long. They love the place of honor of banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. And again, they love to be greeted with respect and so forth. So it's located, I, would, I wanted to say at the beginning in Luke and Matthew, I know it's other places, but those are the two notable. Now, worse than this for the future of the Jews is going to be that item that I mentioned from Dr. Cook about the collective guilt of the Jews. Matthew is big on this one. <clears throat> so here's something from Matthew 27. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people made their plans how to have Jesus executed. So now we're seeing the, the crucifixion of Jesus as part of a priestly plan, which by the way, historically, this is ludicrous. And this is where it's very different from what we read in Matthew and Luke, which could be seen as an intra-Jewish kind of disagreement, here now we're seeing real hostility towards the Jews in this particular area, which Matthew was known for. So they bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate the governor. And Pilate, by the way, a real historical figure, we know about him, not a good guy, never depicted anywhere as a good guy. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders saying, I have sinned for I have betrayed innocent blood. So in the version that Matthew presents, Judas, the traitor, comes forward and says, I testified falsely against Jesus. And what do the Jews say? The Jewish leaders, they say, what is that to us? That's your responsibility. So you see this is building up to something not good that is going to be repeated in churches for thousands of years. Now, we get Jesus in front of Pilate, and I can't read the whole thing, but I will read this part. According to the Matthew version, it was the governor's, Pilate's custom at the festival, we're around Passover here, as you know, to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. All right, he gives them a freebie every year. Yeah, oh, we got all these people, we're about to kill them, but you can pick one. And, and it's up to you, folks. You can pick one. So at that time, it says, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was uh, Jesus Barabbas. Not our Jesus, a different Jesus, right? A, a real criminal, as, as it turns out. So when the crowd gathered, Pilate says to them, who do you want me to release to you, this Barabbas fella or Jesus who was called the Messiah? Because that's exactly the kind of thing that Pilate would do because he's such a devout Christian. He almost sounds like a devout Christian here, doesn't he? He recognizes, the evil governor recognizes this, but the Jews can't. Oh, there's so much more in the New Testament that I can't get into right now uh, in the blindness of the Jews and their inability to understand. But in any case, it goes on to say that the chief priests and elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. They actually talked them into it. They know he's innocent. They have testimony from Judas. Oh, I'm sorry, I did this. Here's your 30 shekels of silver back. And they still want the bad guy, not the wonderful Messiah that everyone can see is like Pilate himself. So he says, which do you want me to release to you? And they say, Barabbas. It's like a scene from uh, the life of Brian. What shall I do then with Jesus who was called the Messiah? Pilate asked him. And they all answered, crucify him. This, by the way, was the foundation of some of the uh, narrative of Jesus Christ Superstar, which is why rabbis freaked out when that show appeared in the 1970s. Why? What crime has he committed, asked Pilate. Pilate, the guy who's about to put him on a cross. And what do they do? They shout all the louder, crucify him. 
All the people answered, this is one verse further down, his blood be on us and on our children. If you ever needed a substantiation for, for the church's doctrine that the Jews were guilty of deicide, there it is. His blood be on us and on our children. Paul, who is, of course, not one of the gospel writers, uh, but is the guy in most people's estimation who really uh, kind of invents Christianity in a way, he builds upon this collective guilt. And he sort of, he, he anticipates God's imminent wrath. He says in one of his letters, this is 1 uh, Thessalonians, for you brothers became imitators of the churches of God and Jesus Christ that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them at last. I don't know if this is a genuine letter of Paul or not, but it's really not material to what we're talking about here, which is that this is in his letters in the book, and it shows that the guilt persists down through time. Now, far worse than this is John. John is the most uh, anti-Jewish of the, of, the, of the four Gospels. It is, uh, and again, I'm embarrassed to be teaching this in front of Mary, but um, it, is one, it is the one of the four that is not a synoptic Gospel. It tells the story in a different way and has a, a different theological bent. Uh, so what does it say in chapter 8? It shows, it depicts Jesus speaking to a group of Pharisees. And this is what this Jesus says, not found in any of the other three Gospels. I know that you are descendants of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. They answered him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus says to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do what Abraham did. You are the father of the devil. You are, you are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks according to his own nature for he is a liar and the father of lies. The Jews are children of the devil. This was a theological debate when, this was, when these were written. The Christians had no power. So I'm gonna give them a little bit of allowance for that. They were not writing this ever imagining themselves becoming the largest religion in the world and becoming the dominant religion of, of all of Europe uh, where so much of this anti-Semitism played out. Be that as it may, it became part of their holy scriptures and the most important book to them. And they heard these words read from pulpits of churches over and over again. They saw them performed in passion plays uh, which uh, continue in some fashions to be performed. I don't know, I don't think they do the anti-Semitic version anymore, but it wasn't that long ago that they were. As the church spread, this anti-Semitism, this anti-Judaism, as you can see, was central in many ways to church uh, philosophy. Um, we see, for instance, one of the church fathers, John Chrysostom, his name uh, in uh, 354, he lived from 354 to 530 CE. He gave something called the homily against the Jews, helping to set the tone. The synagogue he wrote is worse than a brothel and a drinking shop. It is a den of scoundrels, a temple of demons, the cavern of devils, a criminal assembly of the assassins of Christ. I hate the Jews. It is the duty of all Christians to hate the Jews. One of the results of this hatred of the Jews was also, and it's, it's with Christianity today, was also the, uh, the fear of what was known as Judaizing. Did you ever wonder, for instance, how a Sabbath that is so very clearly delineated in the Bible as being on the seventh day winds up being on the first day in Christianity? Well, this is why. The Sabbath was moved. And it was essentially renamed the Lord's Day. Now, no longer in commemoration of, as the Torah says, both the Exodus and the end of creation, but in commemoration 
of Jesus's rise from the dead, which took place on uh, Sunday. The festivals, he writes, of the pitiful and miserable Jews are soon to march upon us one after the other, and then he lists that. And some of these are going to, some of these Christians are going to watch these festivals. We must drive this perverse custom from the church right now. So that had that anti-Judaizing, which was a it was a thread throughout uh, throughout some Christian groups, and there were a lot of Christian groups before uh, they were declared uh, heresies. You know that's that's how religion works, right? Everybody's the same until one gets bigger and then declares the other one's heresies. This follows the Jews into uh, into an all around Europe, as the leaders in Christian Europe develop or solidify doctrines that are based on it, doctrines that now are completely accepted as teaching that the Jews were all responsible for the crucifixion of Christ. It was not until the, uh, uh, the Vatican um, Council in, uh, that Pope, Pope uh, Paul XXIII uh, convened in um, the 1960s until that was renunciated by the Catholic Church, renounced by the Catholic Church. Um, uh, among these were also the idea that the destruction of the temple by the Romans and the scattering of the Jewish people was also a punishment for all these transgressions, only a portion of which have I shared with you just now. And most importantly, for their continued to failure, continued failure to abandon Christi uh, to abandon Judaism and accept Christianity. And this, of course, goes on throughout the entire period until until really until and well into the modern age. Uh, now. It helped the Jews to a certain extent to survive that in Europe, in any case, uh, the church ultimately declared a moratorium on killing the Jews for these reasons, not that it was always obeyed. It was probably more obeyed in the breach than in any kind of success, but on the excuse of keeping the Jews as a living testimony to what happens, the suffering and degradation that will befall those who turn their back on the Christ. So that was the sort of theological excuse for allowing Jews to live. Um, there were practical excuses too. Uh, a lot of, you know, when, when you're the only minority, really one of the only organized communities of minorities in a place, um, it, it, you maybe indeed have certain responsibilities and things that you're doing that other people can. We know, we had talked even earlier in the class about some of those. Um, in, in the 10th and 11th century, as Christianity was really now, had really uh, firmed its grip on, uh, on Europe uh, for quite some time, you know, it began to face all kinds of issues uh, as well. And when internal issues begin to arise or external issues like the ongoing threat from what used to be the, um, the Byzantine empire and is now a Muslim uh, outpost in Europe with the Ottomans, uh, we begin to see that, that things, the countries crack down even more on the Jews as, as, natural, uh, as natural targets. Um, now, the Jews sometimes arrived in places as welcome guests. Um, and that may indeed have been the reason that Jews migrated po to Poland. But the communities in which the Jews first organized themselves in Europe were in the Rhineland and West. And those are the communities we're going to look at first. The key year, uh, in terms of documentation that we have is, uh, is the Crusades, the first Crusades. This is one of the most documented, real uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, painful and, and, and death-ridden years for the Jews. Um, the, the, you all know the story, the reconquest of Jerusalem was declared by the Catholic Church and these bands of crusaders led by monks and by soldiers who included everyone from royalty to runaway serfs and businessmen and adventurers and criminals on their way to the Holy Land, on their way to Jerusalem. They stopped in what at the time were relatively small Jewish communities, but it was, a, it was only at the beginning of the Ashkenazic, Jewry, uh, Ashkenazic Jewish a settlement or, or rather a growth of their communities there. Um, so among them were in the Rhineland, places like Speyer and Worms and Mainz and Cologne. Uh, and we have accounts of what happened there. Uh, we have accounts that recall how parents 
Jewish parents to save their children from being raped or forcibly converted. So there was sort of misguided spirituality here too, uh, even killed their own kids, um, viewing themselves as sort of Abraham's saving their little Isaacs. There's one really important account that historians rely upon written by a man that we otherwise know nothing about in Hebrew, a fellow named Solomon Bar Samson, uh, writing about uh, an attack on, on uh, Mainz, on the Jewish community of Mainz, on the 3rd of Sivan, May 27th, in 1096. Uh, he writes that uh, the enemy of the Jews came with his whole army against the city gate, and the citizens, the Christians, opened it up. Uh, they were led by a German noble named Emiko, who led a band of plundering German and French crusaders. Then the enemies of God, them, said to each other, look, they have opened the gates for us. Now let us avenge the blood of, as he describes it, the hanged one, Jesus. He goes on to describe horrible panic and the gathering of all the Jews in the courtyard. And you almost conjure up images of the Holocaust when you hear this. He writes, as soon as the enemy came into the courtyard, they found one of the very pious there, our brilliant master, Isaac ben Moshe, he stretched out his neck and his head they cut off first. The others wrapped by their fringed praying sh prayer shawls sat by themselves in the courtyard, eager to do the will of their creator. In other words, to die for the sanctification of God's name. So they now view themselves as martyrs. They did not flee to save themselves, but out of love, they received upon themselves God's sentence. So they were victims who blamed themselves in, in, in a way. I could go on and on, but in the interest of time and of uh, sadness, I won't right now. But this is a very extensive description. I'm sure that it has some exaggerations in it. But the fact that we have others as well attesting to this at this crusade, at other moments throughout uh, European, uh, medieval European uh, life, leads us to believe that this is accurate. This period of the Crusades and the time after it also represented a time when the Jews in these various countries were beginning to grow as a community, becoming much more visible. And so again, as, Christian, as Christendom began to face all kinds of internal and external pressures, and you know I can't do all of European history, but you know what some of them are, uh, they continued to both, in some cases, rely upon the Jews in a great, to a great extent for uh, financial needs, but also to engage in the, uh, in the condemnation of Jews. One of the most widespread tools of persecution became what's known as the blood libel. This was an insidious stereotyping of the Jews, and it followed the spread of Christianity all throughout Western Europe. The earliest work that we have detailing a blood libel is uh, from a Latin work, but it's from England by somebody named Thomas of Monmouth. It's called The Life and Miracles of Saint William of Norwich. It is a story of a ritual murder, that's what blood libel is, a ritual murder of a boy named William in 1144. And it's the first of a long series of these kinds of things that are going to emerge all over Europe. The significance of these kinds of accusations is that that uh, with these descriptions, they create an anti-Jewish mentality that complements, or an anti-Semitic mentality that complements everything they've learned theologically in churches about how the Jews treated Jesus. Again, not created for that purpose, but repositioned for that. Um, I'm just skipping ahead a little bit here because I'm looking at the time. Uh, this, this tells the classic story, uh, this, this uh, William of Norwich a tale, tells the classic story of a Jew being selected for, uh, uh, for a Passover sacrifice. This idea that, um, that the Jews uh, uh, use the blood of, of, of uh, Christians for their sacrifice. But it all went much, much deeper than this. And I'm sorry, I'm doing a little editing as I, as I, as I go here, because I, well, the one thing I wanted to be sure that I got to you this week was what I'm about to share here. Can you see this okay? Are they nodding their heads? I lost them. You can't see it? Yeah, but you should be. 
can, can you, you guys can see my, my, my slides? Okay. Yeah, we can see. Okay, thank you. All right, so let's talk about how the church then used art to further these kinds of claims. So here's a, here's a particular kind of blood libel that maybe you haven't heard of. This is called host desecration. Anybody he heard of this before? Not from my classes? Host desecration meant, it was the accusation that the Jews would take the wafer, which according to Catholic theology, uh, and the and the 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 principle of the sacrament of transubstantiation becomes the body of Christ, and they would torture it and make it bleed. Had you heard of this before? Nobody's heard of this before. This was a widespread, a widespread Jewish uh, uh, blood libel that they would do this. Here's another depiction of it. There they are, torturing the cookie, those Jew, the Jews, as, as, my, as we used to joke about it. You know, this is from the 16th century, by the way, uh, de detailing uh, a 15th century desecration of the hosts, as they're called, because they host the body. Um, but look at some of these other depictions as well. Here's a blood libel. This one is called The Murder of Simon of Trent. This is on Martin Luther's church in Wittenberg, Germany. So here we have uh, the story of a boy named Simon from the city of Trent, whose disappearance was blamed on the leaders of the Jews. And here are the Jews sacrificing him to get his blood, assumedly, I guess, to make their Passover matzah. Here is one that simply illustrates uh, how ignorant the Jews are. So this is from church, uh, the, the, the book of Psalms saying that the fool in his heart says there's no God, meaning Jesus. Here's another one. I got to, I'm sorry, I'm trying to move things around. Uh, the Jews were given distinct clothing to wear. I didn't have time to get into that, but I wanted you to see that. These conical hats, which prefigure the stars of David in Nazi Germany. Um, skip that one. Here's the Jews being brought, here's Jesus being brought before Caiaphas, the high priest. So an illustration in a church of the story we read from Matthew. But these are the ones that I wanted to share before we finished. The church developed this, uh, this sort of notion that was displayed in artwork of, I and mean, you see it in churches all throughout Europe, I just have a few pictures here, of what's known as ecclesia and synagoga. Now this one is from the portal of the Strasbourg Cathedral. Um, it's in a museum now. And this depicts the church over here as this beautiful woman with the, the chalice and the cross, generally looking up or outward. She's frequently compared to the Jewish matriarch, Rachel. And this one here is the synagogue, looking down, blindfolded, weak of eye, about to drop the, the scriptures on the floor, holding them downward towards the floor. And, uh, and Leah, Leah, uh, the sister of Rachel, uh, being portrayed in, the, in the, uh, the Tanakh, the Torah, as weak of eye, in other words, in, unable to see the truth that lies before them. <clears throat> I didn't have both pictures, but here is synagogue on the on the uh, uh, Notre Dame before the <coughs> excuse me before before the fire, of course. Here in Chart, uh, blindfolded, and in this case by the snake from the Garden of Eden. And finally, I mentioned uh, the anti-Semitic uh, uh, claim about the Jews not eating the pork, not eating the pig. This, is, this was a part of a, of, of a German folk tale that speaks about the Judensau, which is the, uh, its popularity was long lived right through Nazi Germany, that the Jews were actually in many ways descended from the pig, uh, the most unclean animal. So there you have it, if you, if you didn't appreciate in words, there you have it in art. So what were the results of all of this? Well, you heard some of them in the depiction of the Crusades that I read, that short passage among many, many that exist. But what happened was in Western uh, Europe, in Western Europe and Central Europe, but mostly in Western Europe, we had a series of expulsions that took place. Uh, the first of which, uh, was in uh, was in France, 
um, not necessarily within the borders of what we know as, of as France today, uh, but when the King Philip Augustus came to, pow to power there, he needed money. The Jews had been lending money. The nobles were in debt to the Jews. And the way he solved this is he took the Jews' money and then he even took a tax on top of that and he expelled them. This was very common. England in 1290, same reason. The king needed money. The nobles needed to be forgiven their debts from the Jews. He solved two problems with one solution. The Jews were thrown out of England. I'm a big Anglophile. I love a lot of things England, but this is not my favorite moment in British history. Uh, they were not formally readmitted. They actually were not formally readmitted uh, uh, until after Cromwell, but Cromwell opened the door to their readmittance. Uh, he had this belief that the, the uh, salvation of all mankind wouldn't occur until the Jews were in every country on earth. Um, and so he, he readmitted them. Pure, pure, fun, fun free Puritan that he was, uh, he welcomed the Jews back. Um, we, we read a book in one of our book club uh, things about, uh, about that whole period of uh, the 17th century Jew, uh, Jews. Um, now, what else happened uh, in addition to these expulsions? Well, importantly, Jewish communities became very limited because they relied upon a special charter, a dispensation given to them for protection by the kings, the dukes, whoever was in charge of any given area. They were very limited in what they could do for a living. Uh, Jews could not join guilds, and guilds, of course, were required for most trades. Things eventually came, became so bad that between the expulsions and the inability to learn a living, and this is a very foggy area in, in Jewish history right now, and much argued about, but according to the Rhineland uh, th uh, hypothesis or thesis, they began to flee where they found in the, in the much more wide open spaces of a growing Poland, they found a welcome. And indeed in Poland, they flourished and would go on to flourish for hundreds of years, despite what happened there, uh, particularly uh, became particularly bad in the 18th, uh, the 17th and 18th century. But before that, uh, there was actually even uh, autonomy for the Jews. There was something called the Council of the Four Lands. It's beyond the scope of a discussion mm -hmm. of anti-Semitism, but they were, they were granted an awful lot of autonomy. And it's not part of the, the broader picture of anti-Semitism, at least not in a one hour review, uh, which allows us to skip to um, another part of Europe where uh, not Ashkenazim, but Saf what, who would become known as Sephardic Jews, Sephardic being one of the names for Spain, as we talked about in an earlier class, uh, where they were meant to suffer. So as we know, the Spanish, the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal were very, very friendly to the Jews for a long time. Under Islam, this was and contained the golden age of Spain. Now we're rewinding a little bit again, back to the 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th centuries. But as the so-called Reconquista, the reconquest of the Christians of Spain and Portugal proceeded, wherever the Jews found themselves, either in the crosshairs of the Moors who were fighting the Christians or under the, the, the uh, protection now of Christians, things had the potential to get worse. This is a very complicated story, and I'm telling it like a cartoon, because there's just no way to, to give the, the depth of the story. There were plenty of areas in the Christian zones that were very amenable to Jews, and there were plenty of parts of the Muslim sections that had uh, good periods and bad periods, depending on which Muslim group was in charge. Uh, but by and large, by 1492, when we uh, learned that uh, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, do you guys grow up with that poem? Rin probably didn't. You did? Oh my God, that's, that's just terrible. Uh, <laughs> well, as we know, uh, there was something else going on that year. And on July 30th of that year with the Reconquista and the, uh, the, unity, the, the unifications of the various uh, Spanish uh, thrones, Ferdinand and Isabella, uh, mother of that nice uh, Queen Aragon, who King Henry VIII uh, divorced. At any rate, she 
signed, they signed into effect the Alhambra decree, which called for the forced, con uh, the, uh, the uh, conversion, I guess it was kind of forced conversion if a Jew desired to stay um, or uh, expulsion uh, of all those Jews who decided uh, not to convert. And that was time to Tisha B'Av. If you remember when we talked about the Jewish calendar, we mentioned Tisha B'Av as the ninth of Av, that day of Jewish, of Jewish suffering when the temples came down according to both history and lore. And the Christians knew about it because as you can see, Christian leaders knew a lot. There were a lot of Jews, by the way, who converted to Christianity and became the Jews' worst enemies. The Jewish expulsion was ultimately the pet project of a guy who was uh, first introduced to me by uh, Mel Brooks, uh, because in the history of the world part one, <laughs> I'll never forget the joke that it was Torquemada, uh, uh, the otherwise not very funny Toma de Torquemada, uh, who staged the Inquisition. And the, the joke was you, could, you couldn't talk about anything. Um, but indeed, it was not aimed specifically at believing Jews and certainly not the Hasidic Jews who didn't exist and certainly never existed in Spain that were depicted by Mel Brooks. Um, it, was, it was aimed at the Jews who stayed and became Christians, some of them with open hearts, happy, maybe even relieved to become part of the majority, and others in trepidation, temporal temporary conversions meant to stave off the worst uh, until they could get their act together. So what about the ones who left? Well, this has been a subject of enormous, intense scholarly debate for a long time in, in terms of how many of them there were. Uh, some scholars say up to 200,000, others say many fewer. We don't know, we will never know, but we do know where a lot of them went. There's a wonderful new film now uh, called, uh, I think, Children of the Expulsion. It was part of the Detroit Jewish Film Festival this fall. So if you have a chance to yeah. see it, highly recommend it. I don't know if I'm getting the title right. Uh, but a large minority of them absolutely left and they went all over the place. We know they went to Turkey because the, they established great communities there uh, and they brought with them their own sort of Yiddish. It was Judeo-Spanish, which is now today, it's called Ladino. They went to Italy. They went to North Africa, but the ones who stayed, who became known to us as Anusim, meaning those who were forced, it actually also means those who were sort of raped, uh, that's what the word is related to, uh, or crypto Jews, became known to many of the Christians there, the old Christians and Jews as Moranos, swine, traitors. Torquemada's inquisition was, as I said, not directed against Jews who were Jews. Those people were supposed to have left. The Inquisition was a search for, uh, a search for heretics. It was aimed at finding those Christians who were not sincere Christians. But it fell disproportionately on the shoulders of the Cristianos Nuevos, the new Christians. And that was because for the very first time, maybe since the ancient anti-Semitism that we opened with of Apion and Tacitus and so forth, it may have really been a, 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 a sort of a foreshadowing of the racialization of the Jews. I'm not gonna go into it too deeply. We actually talked about it in our very first session, but there was a concept that began to spread not only about the Jews, but also about, about others called, um, whoops, <laughs> I'm getting your texts, uh, so hold on, I just have to adjust my screen. Um, Dory was sending me the text, and, and uh, maybe um, I'll read that at the, at the very end, just make sure I got it right. Uh, but uh, it, the, the idea was it, was, it was aimed also at, at Moors and others who converted to Christianity. It was called the limpieza de sangre, the purity of blood, that they had to, in, in a sense, purify the Jewish blood into Christian blood over some number of generations. And the lengths that they went to find apostasy, Christian apostasy, secret Christians was uh, unbearable to explain or to describe uh, some of the worst kinds of tortures. And that movie goes into it, so I won't. Um, ultimately, many left. 
Some went to Portugal, which turned out to be a terrible decision because Portugal forcibly converted all of their Jews and set, then set the Inquisition on them in, in one of the most vicious displays of it, of the Inquisition. Um, but when they and Spanish Jews and some others were over time, and in some cases it took generations able to go, they also went, and that's part of this documentary, uh, to South America. Ultimately, some of those people wound up arriving in New York. Um, there was a place in uh, Brazil known as Recife with a small Jewish population that went back and forth between Portugal and Holland. And when the Portuguese took it back again, the Jews there went up to New Amsterdam and became the very first Jews in New York. Uh, but others went to Holland as well, uh, the Netherlands being a, a republic uh, at the time that was fairly tolerant and they were able to find shelter there. That's how Spinoza's family, for instance, got there. Um, there are still, uh, in, if you go to New York, there's a Spanish and Portuguese synagogue there. And you can even see the graves of some of their, uh, some of their early descendants. That generation of American Jews did not leave a lot of descendants. Uh, it wasn't until the mid 19th century that we got the first real influx of Jews who left behind descendants. Well, we've talked a lot about the Inquisition and the Catholics. What about the Protestants? <laughs> we know that one of the most significant events in, uh, in all of, of Western history and certainly European history was the Reformation. Um, there was no, no shortage of blood shed in the Reformation for all kinds of reasons and by all kinds of people from the minute that uh, I'm going to say his name wrong, Jan Hus, uh, all the way through... Um, uh, through Luther and Calvin and, and, and on and on. Uh, but uh, Luther is a particularly interesting study in all of this because when he started in the 15th century, going into the 16th century, when he started his resistance to the Catholic Church and his 95 theses, I think I'm saying the right number, okay, his 95 theses, he seemed like he was going to be quite the pal of the Jews. <laughs> And he was very sympathetic to the Jews. It fit his theology. He felt that the Jews had rejected Christ because the version of Christianity they were being presented was horrible. No better than what they already had in its legalism and everything else. And it probably did bear a lot of, of comparison than the legalism to Judaism. But <clears throat> he was disabused of the idea that his creation and his reformation was going to create a, a brand new Christianized loyal Jew when the Jews simply did not uh, did not uh, uh, convert. And uh, I don't have a, a lot of time to read you uh, what he wrote, but at one point he pens a work called On the Jews and Their Lies. So you can see he, he jumped the, the barrier from philo-Semitism to, or whatever you wanna call it, to anti-Semitism. And he writes this, I made up my mind to write no more about them, but since I learned that those miserable and accursed people do not cease to lure to themselves, even us, the new Christians, you know, the new reformed Christians, I have published this little book so that I, be, so that I might be found among those who oppose such poisonous activities of the Jews and who warn the Christians to be on their guard against them. They have failed to learn any lesson from the terrible distress that has been theirs for over 1400 years in exile. If these, blows do, if these blows do not help, it is reasonable to assume that our talking and explaining will, explain, will, will, will help even less. And he goes on and on and on to talk about their sufferings and how well-deserved they are and so forth. So seeing the lateness of the hour and not wanting to rush through this last portion, um, that's why I left myself a little wiggle room in the last uh, in the last class so I could sort of pick up anything. I'm going to hold off on the Enlightenment because it's its own era and it leads into all kinds of new joys and, and miseries for the Jews. And so we'll pick that up in two weeks from tonight where we'll talk about the emancipation, which stemmed from the Enlightenment, how anti-Semitism morphed into the most vicious version that we would ever see, um, and a version that sadly is still very, very, very much uh, in play, much more so than any theological version, because to their credit, the various churches 
Well, they reformed themselves when it came to anti-Semitism, uh, but left to some of the people that we, uh, that we would otherwise have admired as secularists, um, things went in new and terrible directions of nationalism, um, of some of the things that we're seeing in this country right now and in Europe as well. So I'll hold off on that for next week, but we will also have a lot of time to talk about uh, a little bit about the establishment of the state of Israel, how that was an answer to so many problems of the Jews and whether it created new problems for us, whether American Jewry and any of the questions that you have, we should be able to get all that done next week and to have a satisfactory conclusion to my surprisingly um, logical order, which I did not necessarily anticipate would be that logical. So uh, if you take a look in the chat, I think people have left, um, there it is, the, the uh, uh, expulsion film, it's there. And I got this text from Dorit on my own mail. Um, yes, Jews lived in Poland for a thousand years, that is true. But the big influx, and this is why it's such a controversial story, and maybe I'll address that next week too, um, as to exactly where, where and how the Jewish community in Eastern Europe developed. We're still not entirely sure. And there seem to have been different waves of Jews living there. Um, in Eastern Europe and in diff different parts of Eastern Europe. But what we think of as the Rhineland hypothesis is this idea that the ones that are there now, and it's because of the, uh, it's because of the, the existence of the language Yiddish that we think this, because it's a Germanic language after all, uh, even though some people have still tried to, compl to claim it's something out, it's something else. So that, that has helped us with that. But yeah, there were Jews even living there 2000 years ago and around the Black Sea and so forth. So this, you know, this is highly simplified in a survey class. We could do a whole class and someday I will on just the history of Jews in Eastern Europe.